y'all. So last couple weeks I've had to finish up a research paper and final test of one of my classes so that's kept me kind of busy. But one of the, my favorite parts about the research stage of a paper is all of the information you come across that you never anticipated. Um, and it may be something completely different from what you're actually researching, but it gets your attention anyway. And what I wanted to talk about today is one of those things that I came across. It was fascinating. Um, there really wasn't any room in my paper for it. It just wasn't on topic. But I'm bringing it to y'all here on YouTube. So, um, for my research, it looks like this really hasn't been mentioned very many places at all. Certainly not recently by historians. Um, and even though it's kind of a brief anecdote about the French and Indian War, it, it gives us a good space to discuss a couple other related things that are of historical value. Um, so a couple things to get when we get started here. Um, I will be using the term Indians throughout this video. To be honest, I really hate the term. I hate it because of the history of it. Um, and, and using the term gen Indians, there's a lot of generalizations that have been made and just, I, I use tribe names where I can. And when I can't, I'm not a big fan of, of this term, but um, when we're talking about the French and Indian War, we're talking about uh, things that were recorded where, you know, nobody knew the tribe, they were making generalizations about Indians. I just feel like it's kind of appropriate to continue that term in this context. Um, because a lot of times you will find that it, it kind of, it's a good placeholder for a lot of the assumptions and, and, and misunderstandings that were made at the time. So, um, I just want to cover, cover that base. I'm going to be using it here. It is the French and Indian War, after all. Um, but I, I do think it's something that, that should be considered as far as the terminology. And it's something that I will get into more at, at some point later on, um, because there's a lot of good discussion to be made there. Uh, and, and before I leave this topic... <laughs> I also want to talk about the concept of morning wars versus total wars. Now, when Europeans came to North America, they were used to something called total war. Um, and, and actually, that's a term that I've only really seen one historian use, which is Fred Anderson. But I'm sure it's probably been used elsewhere. And regardless, it's a perfect term to use when I'm describing this. And basically what it means is Europe, Europe was overpopulated. So in wars that involved European countries, they weren't really worried about the cost in lives because their populations could bear it. Um, for, for them, there were other concerns. You know, do I have the money to continue this war? Do I have the supplies? Not so much whether the peasants and other people who served under them as soldiers really died. They, they didn't care. Um, it's unfortunate, it's fact. In North America, the situation was really different. North America was not overpopulated the way Europe was. In order for tribes to maintain their strength against their enemies, they needed to maintain their population. So when there were conflicts between tribes here, um, you know, today, like most of the time, I'm talking specifically about the East Coast because my main focus is colonial America. But um, I think this is probably something that we would see throughout the continent where when they go to war, they're not trying to kill as many people as they can. They're trying to maintain the strength of their own tribe, and they're trying to dissuade their enemies from attacking again. Those are their priorities. So in mourning wars, um, which is so named because they're, they're mourning their loss, right? It's not the time of day. It's to mourn for something. Um, in mourning wars, they're just trying to make themselves whole and prevent future issues. So you see a couple of things. You see a lot of people taken captive, um, usually women and children. It could happen with men too, but usually women and children. And, and these captives would be usually assimilated within the tribe that captured them. Because again, they're trying to maintain their strength, their population level. They need this fresh blood to keep them whole. So you see that a lot throughout history. Um, you know, a lot of Europeans would get captured, they get adopted. 
sometimes the way that gets referenced in history doesn't really do justice to the reason for it. Um, you know, it, it's not something cruel and unusual. This was this was a way that the native population, the indigenous tribes, respected life and, and didn't want to waste it unnecessarily. Something else you'll see is that when it comes to warriors between tribes, when they would fight, it would be small scale, typically. Um, and you would see a lot of torture after the fact. If there was a captured warrior, most likely they were they would get kind of ritually tortured to death. Um, a couple things connected to that, you know, kind of a, the, um, they would be assuming the, the, the power of the warrior spirit. Um, but it, but it also goes back to dissuading future attacks, right? So a lot of times when Europeans, especially in the colonial period, have written about the warfare, the conduct of the, the Indians, um, these are things that they're misunderstanding. They, they don't, they don't comprehend it, so they make a lot of assumptions and quite often miss the mark. So um, I bring that up because in one of the sources I was able to find for what I'm talking about today, they referred to um, the actions as having saved the lives of all these women and children. Maybe. Uh, but there's a good chance they didn't really. What it saved them from was being taken captive and adopted into a tribe, which is not so terrible a fate throughout the colonial period. We see many people who were uh, captured and adopted in this way. And then once ransomed, they preferred to actually remain within the tribe that had adopted them. Um, even people who were who were captured as adults, right? So it's, it's not so horrible a thing um, in, in this context. Now, the events that I'm about to talk about we're towards the beginning of the French and Indian War, and towards the beginning specifically, we see a lot of attacks on the frontier. Um, what I've researched is the Virginia frontier. That's actually what my paper was on, um, kind of a small subset of that. Uh, these events are actually um, by what is now Martinsburg, West Virginia. So you're a little bit further up. Um, if you're familiar with the, the Great Wagon Road or the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road that, that went down from Pennsylvania, down through the Shenandoah Valley, um, down through the Appalachians, and, and it was a major means of travel as the frontier expanded and as everyone was looking for new land. Um, this path had actually been used for a long time before by the native tribes, which it was called the Great Warrior's Path. It would be used... Um, to conduct raids, to trade, a lot of different uses. So this was nothing new for, for travel to go this way. So where we are is higher up on that road than what I'm used to, to studying, but um, it's all part of the same fort chain. Um, this is something that George Washington worked a lot on during the French and Indian War to try to boost the defense of the frontier um, by building all of these forts that were somewhat close to each other, forming kind of like a chain going down um, so that most of the settlers could make it to a fort if they needed to. This didn't always work because the frontier was a huge area. You never knew when or where there would be an attack. So the idea of getting to a fort ahead of time is not necessarily practical and it did not always work that way. And many of the forts were not able to survive being attacked either. So there, a lot to be said there. But what I want you to know going into this story is that in June of 1754, there had been a lot of, we'll call them Indians, visiting settlers on the frontier. Um, this happened in Augusta, um, Augusta, yeah, Augusta County. But the thing is that Augusta County at that time was huge and encompassed pretty much the entire backcountry, the frontier region of Virginia, which again was huge at the time. Um, I do not know what tribes these were. The references I've been able to find just referred to them as Indians. So it could have been the same tribes that would later attack, or it could have been friendly tribes that didn't want to see that loss of life and issued the warning. Either way, the settlers had a bit of advance notice. Hey, get ready, get prepared. You need to leave or you need to be able to defend yourself. Um, and, and then in October of 1755, so a little bit over a year later, we have a letter that George Washington wrote to Governor Dinwiddie um, lamenting the, the failures and the weaknesses of the militia, which is kind of ironic given Washington's defeat at Fort Necessity. Um, but 
<sighs> now where was I? I just had kids yelling to me about cats eating things that are not edible. Joy. So <laughs> anyway, um, so we have George Washington writing to Dinwiddie talking about the militia. And, and he says in this letter that it is the third time he has brought it up to Dinwiddie. Um, and, and basically what we want to get into here, which plays into the defense of this event, is what the militia, what they were, what they were comprised of. Because militia wasn't regular army. They weren't men who they went and they signed up. They were like, hey, I'm volunteering to defend. No, militia at this time was a fancy word for all the able-bodied adult men. So you're starting around 16, 17, going up to say 60. Any men that had the, men, huh, any man that had the capacity to defend the area were considered militia. And they didn't, they didn't travel typically, you know, if you have militia in the back country of Virginia, they're not going to end up down in South Carolina or up in Massachusetts. That's not their job. Their job is to defend their area and then go home each night, eat at their own table and sleep in their own bed. So militia, the expectations that are there for what, you know, the the elite governing the, the military wanted is a little unrealistic because these are not actually military men. They're not men who have been trained for this. This is not their only profession. They have families, they have farms, they have stuff they've got to do. Um, so you get a lot of both sides when you, when you study this. And I just want to put that out there because a lot of people don't understand that about the militia. And when you talk about their incompetence or you talk about, you know, they didn't quite do this right or they weren't prepared for this, there's a reason because it's not their job. Um, and finally, before I get into the event, I know this is a lot leading up to it, but it's all of value. Um, I want to talk about what is, is known about the colonial period. I think a lot of times, because it is relatively recent in the history of humanity, um, people may think that we have so much documentation and so much information about colonial America um, that, that we just know so much. There's so much material out there. It's all documented. It's all available. No. There's a lot in just the research I've done. Um, there's a lot that survives only because it was a reference in a journal, reference in a letter. Maybe there was a local history written about it that mentions it, um, which is a big part of the case with, with this. <sighs> there's a lot we don't know. And of the information we have, not all of it has been digitized. We get so used to being able to go online and look things up, but there's a lot of stuff that just is not there. And I say that with the ability to go through my university library databases, go through journals, search through all sorts of digital sources, and still not really coming up with much. Um, so we need to understand that limitation and understand that sometimes there's going to be conflicting information and we're just not going to actually know what the truth is. So we just have to enjoy the story, get out of it what we can, uh, and, and, and move on to the next thing. So Fort Evans was a small stockade in, like I said, Martinsburg, uh, West Virginia, a little bit south of there, uh, of where it is now. And it was just a local fort put together after, you know, they realized the danger. Um, it was built primarily by John Evans, which is uh, the husband of Polly Evans, who features in this story. Um, throughout the, especially the early period of the, the French and Indian War, you'd see a lot of um, groups of Indians traveling throughout the, the frontier in small groups, kind of raiding here, raiding here, attacking up here. Um, you'd see some French traveling with them, but, you know, usually predominantly Indian forces. Um, I know the Shawnee did it a lot, but that's more in my other research, so I don't know if they were as active up there. Again, this is why I'm going with the generalization in this instance. Um, so they had built this fort. Um, and, and, and most people were kind of sheltered within this fort at, at the time of this attack, which was in spring of 1756. Um, and it actually hadn't been finished for that long. So, you know, John and his wife Polly, they're within the fort and a little boy runs in brings word that John's brother's house is on fire. Um, his brother had made it to the fort as well, but it was on 
it was on fire, someone else in the area had been killed. So the men of the militia who are at Fort Evans decide that they're going to go pursue these attackers uh, and, and bury the dead. So all the men of the militia leave. And they leave the fort entirely unprotected, given the you know, perception of the time. It was only women and children, which were not expected to be able to fight. They just weren't, you know. Women are capable of a lot, but at various points of the, in history, that hasn't really been well understood, except in this case. So they go, they leave, and then Polly Evans realizes that the attackers are actually in the area around the fort, and they're in danger. So what she does, and, and this is kind of where we see a little bit of variation in the reports, um, but she has one of the boys that they have there, one of the younger boys, beat a drum as if they're calling militia to arms, um, you know, readying the men. She rallies some of the women, the ones that feel like they can, they can handle the pressure, um, and she gets their help to defend the fort. Now, some sources imply that the women who help her just help with like ammunition, um, maybe they loaded some rifles, and they credit Polly with most of the, the major action. Some other sources imply that all the women did this together. Either way, it was a pretty cool thing because the women get all their weapons out, they, they, they make noise, they get their ammo, they do all of this stuff, and they start firing out of like the, the gun ports on the side of the fort. And they fire so much that they convince the attackers that the fort isn't unguarded at all. Maybe there's some in there. Maybe there's something that they missed and not everyone left. But apparently the fort is guarded. We, It wouldn't be worth it to attack. The group of attackers leave. Fort Evans remains, unlike many other forts that did not make it through the war. Everyone is safe because Polly Evans and the women of the fort were able to convince the Indian party. It's not worth it to attack here. And I mean, that's a, that's a short anecdote. There's not that much there. Um, but I think it's cool because when you, when you research the fighting that happened on the frontier during this time, I mean, I'm not an expert, but this is the only example I've come across of women fighting. It's not something that I, I see talked a lot about. I think when I looked for everything I could find, there was really only five places that cited it. And some of those were quoting the others among the five. Um, it's credible enough. I don't know if this is really a good gauge, but it's credible enough that uh, West Virginia has a historical marker in the area that Fort Evans was telling about how Polly Evans defended the fort with the other women. Um, but I just think it's fun. It's interesting. It's a really good opportunity to talk about the context of this. Like I said, the morning wars versus the total wars, the, the fort chain, what a militia is. And then also that reminder that the women on the frontier, even though society had them kind of pegged in this one little corner of, of what was acceptable and what wasn't, they still knew how to step up when they needed to. Um, a lot of these settlers would have been Scotch-Irish, which means, usually, this is a very broad term, again, generalizations, usually Scots-Irish means it was someone who was Scottish that moved to Ireland, um, for various reasons, often religious freedom because they were Protestants, and then after living in Northern Ireland for a time, they, uh, immigrated to America. So they're called Scots-Irish because there's a little bit of, of both of those countries in their history, even though a lot of the times their, their blood, they were actually just, just Scottish. But this, this people group weren't huge on women's rights. Not that anyone really was back then, but up in New England with the Puritans, you see a little bit more, um, you know, you see education for women, you see a little bit more consideration of them on the frontier this was not the case at all women could be beaten and nobody would stop it women it's it was not great but this is a great reminder that despite that their spirit wasn't broken 
and they were willing to step up at any time they needed to. And I do have to question why I was only able to find five sources talking about this. Why aren't more? And you know, let me look at my notes here, but of these sources, the most recent was 1973. Before that, 1928. Why? I'm not sure. But I'm hoping the next video is going to be talking about Lord Dunmore's War, which is another thing I was researching for this. And it shows, again, the spirit of the, the backcountry Virginians and what they were able to accomplish. Also, again, there's some stuff we just don't know and may only ever be able to theorize. But I think that's kind of half the fun. So let me know what you thought. Let me know if there's something from this that you didn't know, that you find fascinating, um, as well as anything you'd like me to cover in the future. Like, subscribe, help me out. Thanks.